I'm proud to say that one of the first sponsors I have for this podcast is Rhythmia Life Advancement Centre. Rhythmia is a unique and special place to me. It's a healing resort fused with ayahuasca, uh, meditation, breathwork, yoga, and lots of other metaphysical teachings. And they really um, sent me on a journey of healing and self-discovery that ultimately led to the creation of this podcast. So I really do owe Rhythmia a lot. And if you would like to go there and have a healing journey of your own, please visit them on their website at rhythmia.link forward slash can, spelled K-H-A-N, or give them a call on 877-835-1806 and receive a free shuttle worth $300 off your trip. Educate, inspire, change. Educate yourself, inspire others, change the world. So today I would like to welcome Mike Zappi Zaplin, who is a conscious filmmaker to my podcast. Um, Mike, known as Zappi, has won the Amsterdam Film Festival's Van Gogh Award for his documentary, The Reality of Truth, which has already been seen by more than 7 million people. His soon-to-be-released film, Lamar Odom Reborn, follows the psychedelic intervention that he did on the NBA champion, Dash Kardashian, who has publicly tr- struggled with addiction. Zappi is self-described as a psychedelic concierge, who is often called on to help celebrities, CEOs and thought leaders to have conscious transformations. He is passionate about bringing forward his formula for a conscious transformation, which we will discuss further on in the podcast today. As an entrepreneur, Zappi was an early domain name pioneer, buying and selling some of the most well-known domains, including beer.com, music.com, creditcards.com, and many more. Along with Deepak Chopra, he co-authored Ask the Kabbalah, a beginner's guide to the ancient wisdom of Kabbalah. Zappi believes that as society recovers from the trauma of coronavirus, we should take advantage of plant medicine and other catalysts to dive deep inside our minds for answers and healing. Also, one more point I'd like to add is that Zappi is the co-founder of the Ketamine Fund 591C3. Uh, The stated goal for this fund is to bring down suicide rates by 75%. This fund is dedicated to giving away free treatments to anyone who is having suicidal ideations. They have started veterans suffering from PTSD and they recently completed a small clinical trial with 400 veterans in Utah and the results have been incredible. So Zappi, um, without further ado, welcome to my podcast. It's an honor to have you on. Thank you. Nice to be on here. I've been following your escapades for a while and it's just great to uh, connect. It feels like two conscious filmmakers having a conversation is like a good good place to be. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of synergy between us because um, your documentary, The Reality of Truth, had a big impact on me. And it was one of the catalysts for me beginning my um, plant medicine and spiritual healing journey, you know. So uh, uh, thank you a lot for that. And I know that uh, I'm one of many because I've been to Rhythmia Life Advancement Centre, which is featured in your documentary. And there's many, many people go through those doors and almost all of them have watched your documentary, you know. So um, your documentary yeah. really has had, has had a massive impact on on people uh, in the last few years since you've released it you know it's, it's, it's really crazy the impact when you think about it because since I've healed my family have healed my friends have healed you know and um, what you've been doing is you've been planting those seeds in all our heads just to start this journey so it's a really really uh, great honor to have you on today and to be able to talk about your newest documentary as well which I think you've been working on lately. Yeah I'm really excited the new Lamar Odom documentary is really about the intervention I did using ketamine and Ibogaine. And I'm hoping that this movie can be really what the reality of truth was for Ayahuasca and San Pedro, that this movie can enlighten people about what the opportunity is with ketamine right now and what the opportunity is with Ibogaine because these are breakthrough catalysts that, you know, like Ayahuasca, San Pedro, it's just really Mm. education. We're in the education phase right now. And as these come out, I think for a Western society, uh, these could be the biggest breakthroughs that we've ever had in mental health here. Yeah. So obviously, um, I'm guessing you yourself have done ketamine and iboga therapy. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. I, you know, when I came back from uh, Peru and I was, 
you know, searching myself, still continuing to search and try to find what, Mm -hmm. you know, what answers I could find. I realized that I needed to find, you know, a Western medicine approach that would be easy for people to access in the West. And it started my investigation of ketamine. But at the same time, I was so blown away by what I had learned from ayahuasca and San Pedro that I, even though I didn't have an addiction, I wanted to try the ibogaine because I knew that there was something incredible in there. And I thought to Mm. myself, wow, you know, how could this possibly break a heroin addiction in 12 hours? That doesn't even make sense. I have to Mm. try this. And I went down to Costa Rica and I tried the ibogaine myself and it was an incredible journey. It was really intense. You know, it was, I understand now how it could break a heroin addiction. It was that intense. (laughs) But, you know, when I came out of it, I just, I felt so good. I had, I had, you know, created the ultimate surrender for myself. And I was just embracing that. And, you know, the, the iboga is known to work on your mental and your physical. And so I not only felt incredibly clear in my thinking, but I was also really physically just feeling better and better every single day. And I was like, wow, you know, this is an incredible catalyst. I need to be a mouthpiece for this ibogaine or iboga, um, which is an African root if people don't know. And um, it was really incredible. I can describe some of my experience that were just off the charts as far as, you know, experiences that I think you could ever have. But it was, it was something for, you know, not everybody, but I think if you have an addiction profile or you have a physical ailment that, you know, is just dragging you down, this could really be the answer. Mm. And did you have to go to South America to do Ibogaine, yeah? Um, I went to Costa Rica. I did it privately. You know, a lot of times the... The iboga is very, it's very important that you have a guide and a doctor there because the iboga can be cardiotoxic. It brings your uh, heart rate down and it's really important to have a doctor there monitoring you. And also it's important to have a guide because if you saw in the reality of truth, Jerry Powell, um, Mm -hmm. what he experienced and the breakthrough he had, had a lot to do with the shaman being able to interact with him during the 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 Mm. ceremony and to be able to ask questions of the shaman while it's happening and so i was really fortunate i got myself into a really good set and setting with a great guide and i was being medically supervised and you know it's the ayahuasca is known as you know the mother and the san pedro is known as the father and the iboga is known as the grandfather So it's kind of like this angry grandfather who's, you know, basically like, oh, okay, you want to see why you're messed up? Here, go ahead. And it Mm. just, you know, shows you, you know, a lot of the mistakes you made in your life or the challenges that you maybe didn't address in the right way. And it makes you look Mm. at that without, you know, kind of like, I'm sure you know, when you're in that ayahuasca, it's like your grandmother's hugging you the whole time, mm-hmm. even when it gets really scary or something, the ayahuasca spirits there with you. But the iboga is just, it's so raw. And yeah. the African culture that uses this, the religious group, it's called the Bwiti, and it's an ancestor based religion. And so the idea of the iboga with them is that you take it to have a vision of an ancestor and they just keep feeding you the iboga until you either have that vision of the ancestor or you die so it's Mm. you know serious stuff yeah but at the same time they've been using it for thousands of years it's a really incredible opportunity that we have because it can break a meth addiction a heroin addiction cocaine addiction and these are very difficult addictions to break and you don't even have to detox you just you know, literally Mm. sit down with the iboga and skip the whole detox part of uh, what addiction has. Yeah. How important is, um, like, the people who are to take iboga, is there anyone that you would suggest doesn't take it? For example, people who have health conditions? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, weak heart is really the Mm -hmm. key. They 
they do, you know, when I brought Lamar down there to do his Ibogaine session and, you know, what that was about was, you know, he's had a lot of trauma in his life that he's never addressed. He's never done any psychedelics. Um, you know, it was important with him and with everybody that you make sure that the person's physically able to do it and screened for that. Beyond that, I think, you know, it's pretty much just a how badly do you want it and need it to recover um, yeah. is what it's all about. Yeah, and I'm curious, when I done ayahuasca last year, um, a, a lot of importance was given to preparation and also to your intentions. So with the ibogaine, I think there was a little bit less attention to the preparation uh, in terms of your dieta. But um, uh, what what were your intentions or what was Lamar's intentions even going into his ceremonies and how, how much importance do you give to them? Yeah, so I, for me personally, my intention was, and I always try to make this my intention with plant medicine, is just to really expand my consciousness. You know, rather than saying, I want an answer to this question, or I want to know what mm -hmm. to do with my life. I think if you do that, you know, you open yourself up to, you know, maybe, you know, being disappointed or maybe not getting what you could out of the experience. So I always say, I want to have, I want to expand my consciousness. And I also mm -hmm. want to remember not to take anything serious that happens. That's always my advice to everybody when <laughs> they do ayahuasca, ibogaine, whatever it mm -hmm. is. Um, Lamar, what happened was I really, I triaged him originally using the ketamine and, you know, like I said, he's had a lot of trauma. His mom died when he was 12 years old of cancer. Um, his grandmother that raised him passed away. He had a son six months old that died. And so just a lot of trauma. And he also, you know, he also had this thing where he would, have so much affirmation on the basketball court and in society that he was always sort of seeking that next, that, you know, high level of, um, you know, of, of just affirmation and just excitement in his life. And so you can imagine mm -hmm. when you come off the basketball court like that, and then you go back into your apartment, you know, it's kind of boring and you sitting around and you maybe, you know, you start to have a, cocktail or maybe you take a Xanax or if you get anxiety and you know all it leads to all kinds of problems that are you know kind of unique to somebody like him and so mm -hmm. he uh, he came to me I was actually a screening of a movie that I screened the reality of truth down here in Florida and one of his friends was at the screening and they came up to me after and they said, Hey, Zappy, I just saw your movie. I'm friends with Lamar Odom. He's kind of in a rough place right now. Do you think, you know, maybe plant medicine could be for him? And I said, look, you know, I'd like to talk to him about maybe coming here and doing a ketamine treatment, which is an FDA approved medication. It's an anesthetic, mm -hmm. but Yale university figured out that if you give somebody a low dose, it can break depression it can grow new neural pathways in the brain around trauma, you know, it's a really breakthrough uh, catalyst. Cleveland Clinic actually called it a top 10 medical breakthrough. And on the list, it was the only mental health one, which means it's probably the biggest breakthrough in mental health ever. Um, mm -hmm. So I said to Lamar, I said, look, I'm involved with a clinic down here. I would like you to come and do a treatment. You, he said, I've never done any psychedelics before. He said, I have been told to avoid them. You know, I think, you know, he had even told me, you know, that's basically like white people drugs. He's like, you know, I've been told to stay away because if I have, if you have a bad experience and you flip out or have a bad trip, you know, you could be shot by the police. You could be put in a mental institution. It's just a really kind of a, something that we have to address in the psychedelic culture to make sure that there's no, you know, racial bias or anything like that, just that people can have these experience in the right set and setting. So he said, no, I've never done anything. So I said, why don't you do the ketamine? I'll guide you. And my partner, Warren Gumpel and ketamine, we guided him and he had this first experience. It only lasts about 45 minutes. And he went inside himself, Lamar, and he said, you know what? He goes, I just never felt so good inside before. And he's like, I felt like I went to heaven and I came back. 
And I was like, wow, this is incredible. You know, it's in the movie. And he continued, I gave him a couple more ketamine treatments. And after he was comfortable with me and going inside, I said, look, Lamar, you have an addiction profile. You know, you're an African-American guy. There's an African-American root. Maybe you're even supposed to be interacting with it, but you've been cut off by, you know, culture for the last, you know, however many, you know, hundreds of years. So mm -hmm. why don't you let me guide you to do an Ibogaine treatment and see if you can break this anxiety, this addiction now and why, you know, why mess around? And he agreed. We drove down to Mexico. We did a private treatment with a doctor and a guide and his intent was to you know, just try to get rid of that anxiety and try to get rid of that, uh, the addiction that he has, that's part of his life. And it was so amazing because we gave him the Ibogaine and the next day he was like, boom, he was just like a different person. You know, he, you see in the movie, he, he saw his six month old son who died. He got to see his uh -huh. son at the age that he died. He got to see him grow to be like, you know, eight or nine years old. Then he saw the kid grow to be, you know, what he would be today, 16 or 17. And he's like, oh, my God, like I got to see my kid. You know, this is mm. that alone was incredible. And he said in the movie that it, you know, brought him closer to God. And he had a lot of just incredible things where he got to hear his mother's voice who he hadn't heard for you know, decades, her voice, and they hear that. So he comes out and 24 hours later, or I should say 48 hours later, we were driving back to Los Angeles and we're in the van and Lamar says out loud, he goes, you know what? He goes, I feel so good mentally and physically. He's like, I think I can make a comeback in professional basketball. And we're all <laughs> like, wow, that's amazing, you know? And his trainer and his bodyguard was with us, a friend of his, and the guy was like, hey, take it easy, Lamar. Like, dude, you know, <laughs> come on. You gotta, you'd got you have to work out four hours a day and you can't be smoking marijuana. And Lamar was like, I know what I got to do. I'm doing it. And we we're all like, wow, that's awesome. And then fast forward four months later, it's in the movie. You see him playing in his per first professional basketball game in Dubai in a tournament. Wow. And it was just like such a rocky moment for him just to do that and to – you know, as he said, to lose his fear of death and to realize that he he should have died and now he has a second chance. And so what? Well, how could he possibly be afraid? And this showed him yeah. just he has nothing to be afraid of. That's amazing. And, and I think really the, fact that you've, the, the fact that you've managed to get someone who's so high profile and to follow that journey, to, to follow that transformation, uh, I, I can see this having a really, really big impact. You know, because there's so many people, um, celebrities and non-celebrities that are suffering from addictions, whether it's alcohol and have had trauma as children, that will resonate deeply with with um, his issues and they'll see his transformation on screen. And I, I, I can imagine it's going to inspire thousands, if not millions of people, you know, so uh, I can't yeah. wait for one to see to see it happen on screen, you know, to watch that transformation because there's nothing better, is there, to see someone go from there to there. Um, in the space of a matter of days, they, they say like having a week on plant medicine is like having 10 years worth of therapy, you know, uh, yes. all, all in one week. And the fact that you're there to capture it on camera just makes it more magical because we're able to share it with everyone else, you know. Since Lamar realized that it was working for him, he started to want to pay it forward, which was incredible. So mm. he brought his dad, who has been on methadone for years, who's been estranged from Lamar most of his life. Lamar brought him to do ketamine treatments because he knew how much trauma his dad had. He brought his ex-wife and his two kids to come do ketamine treatments. And they've oh. come together as a unit in a way that they really never were. And in the movie, you know, his daughter even says, you know, I finally like have my dad, you know, and I know what it's like mm. to, you know, have your father in your life. And so, you know, to see these things, like you were saying, Cash, to see how fast they happen. That's what I love about this. It's like, it's so immediate, the impact. Mm. And then the yeah. person starts to share it out exponentially to people around them. I think Lamar is mm. going to wind up being really like the poster child for mental health and just the fact that it's okay to talk about, you know, even if you're the most, yeah. you know, 
high profile person and you've had all these great, amazing moments in your life, you can still have anxiety, you could still, you know, have addiction. And uh, so I think he's going to, you know, really take the reins on that role. And he's going to be an incredible spokesperson. Wow. I, I can't wait to watch. While you were speaking, I was literally getting goosebumps on my arm, you know, when you were talking about his family and his daughter and they're all healing together. It's just a beautiful, beautiful story to heal because I've got two young children of my own and uh, I know how my journey has affected them, has affected their mother and my mother. Um, I'm going to Rhythmia in July and taking my mum, who's 60 year old, who's a Muslim woman who's never done a drug in her life and she's coming to do the medicine, you know. So it's just like beautiful. Wow. When you can, when you, when you hear these stories of people's families getting healed through them, you know, it's like um, we really are witnessing miracles before our very own eyes, you know, and and uh, I'm really uh, uh, excited to watch this documentary specifically because I, I watched The Reality of Truth this morning just to kind of jog my memory again. And um, mm -hmm. I, I saw the, the importance of transcendental meditation, the importance of daily practices combined then with the medicine itself. Because I think what, one thing that we have to um, remind people is, uh, the medicine is very important, but it's how you integrate it also that's very important, you know. How are you going to then um, behave and treat yourself daily, you know? Uh, and yeah. me for, uh, so I think that's important. And uh, you, you mentioned you've caught some of that on camera. So have you also followed up with Lamar like months afterwards to see how he's doing, how his family are doing? Yeah, we've been, you know, hanging out on a regular basis. Um you know, he's come and done a few more ketamine treatments since because mm -hmm. the ketamine, what, what it is, is amazing is that this is a, a crystal, you know, it's a, it's a crystal substance. They, a lot of people think ketamine is some synthetic thing, but what it is, is they put some salts and minerals together and they grow these ketamine crystals. And mm. they realized a long time ago that as an anesthetic, it's an incredible, you know, uh, medicine to have. And so it's the number one uh, medication, number one anesthesia used by oral surgeons on children, because it's very safe, it oh. doesn't affect your breathing. Mm. And they realized that what was happening on the battlefield is they were, you know, amputating people's arms out and legs out in the battlefield, and they were giving them ketamine while they did it. And the next day, the guy would be like joking around. And they were like, wait a minute, what's going on here? I mean, this guy hasn't joked around in two years and then we just amputated his leg and now he's joking, what, what's up? So they studied at Yale University, did a huge study on ketamine and they realized that not only is this very safe, but if you give somebody a low dose of it over a period of time, that mm. it can have a couple of amazing effects, which is that it can actually, when it metabolizes, it builds new neural pathways in the brain around trauma and depression. So a lot yeah. of people have these patterns that they've inherited or some trauma has occurred where they have these loops of, you know, I'm not good enough. It's not going to work out. Nobody loves me. Like I'm a drug addict. These patterns that they run everything through and the ketamine mm -hmm. just basically when it metabolizes, builds these new neural pathways around that and they're in a totally different place. And that's why the number one side effect of ketamine treatment is that it breaks suicidal ideation. And, you know, of course we're living in a, we have a suicide epidemic going on right now. And mm -hmm. so to have something that can break that immediately, you know, in 45 minutes is gone is a miracle, number one. Uh, but there's new science out on the ketamine that's really amazing, which is that, uh, you have an area of your brain called the default mode network. And in that, there's a mechanism called your lateral habanula. And it's what it is, is it basically uh, takes in all the stress that you've ever had in your life. It, it records that. And then when it gets to be too much, it gets this tipping point and it go, your brain goes into burst mode, which is actually a different brain state. And it, what it does is it shuts off your dopamine production. And so your dopamine is basically your happiness, your motivation to do things. And so you're getting no dopamine. Well, the first time you do the ketamine, your first treatment, it resets that brain state, takes it out of burst mode. Now you're starting to get your dopamine back and people are, you know, they're transformed in mm -hmm. one session. 
And then the idea is to do a series of sessions to build up enough neural pathways to, you know, kind of offset whatever, you know, patterns you have. It's, this is like a breakthrough moment where, you know, science and um, necessity have brought some of these catalysts to the forefront. It's really remarkable. I'm very curious because you're the first person I've probably spoken to in any great length about ketamine, you know, and and its benefits. But I'm interested to know, obviously, I, I, I have an understanding of San Pedro, ayahuasca, iboga, and uh, uh, these plants have a consciousness, yeah? They have like a, yeah. a, a kind of spiritual uh, substance to them. I'm, I'm interested to know what are your views on ketamine with this? Do you believe that ketamine has a consciousness as well? Yeah, that's a really good question. And and you're one of the few people that has enough experience with the others to really probably even appreciate this, which is, Mm -hmm. it's really interesting. The ketamine doesn't have a specific spirit, but what happens is you immediately go into this present moment awareness space where there's no future, no past, you're just in the present moment. And when you're in Mm -hmm. that state, you know, you could live a thousand lifetimes in a half an hour in that state. And you're, you are doing that. And you're just like, oh my God, you're seeing so much happening. And it's so beautiful to be in that present moment awareness, because I think a lot of people in society right now, they're, they're just chasing and running after everything and, you know, onto the next thing. And they never get into that just, you know, place where you want to get to, let's say if you meditated in a cave for 30 years and you finally hit this point where you're right there in present moment awareness. Well, the ketamine puts you right there without you even trying. It's like you're a yogi of 30 years. You're like, whoom. And a lot of people say that while the spirit part of it isn't really there, it's a complete God conscious experience. So you are one to one with God. And, um, You know, Timothy Leary back in the 1960s when he was doing his research, uh, he wrote a paper called The Eight Areas of the Brain, and he described each area of the brain and how you affect it with these different catalysts. And he described your left brain being your, um, your survival brain and your right brain being your evolutionary brain. And he said that you could affect your right brain, you know, your fifth area of the brain on the right side with marijuana, the sixth with mushrooms, the seventh with ayahuasca and large doses of LSD. And he said the eighth area of your brain, the highest level where you could use your supercomputer that you have in your in your brain, in your consciousness, he said the way that you affect that is with ketamine. And oh. so when I read that, I was like, wow, you know, Timothy Leary is saying that you unlock that area of your brain with this. And, you know, it's even, you know, I don't know, semi-classified that they give this to astronauts in order to prep them for going into deep space. And Mm. it, yeah, Timothy Leary said, you know, this is probably uh, how you unlock the communications device to be able to even if, you know, communicate with aliens or maybe to you know, communicate with yourself from the future, come back to help yourself in the present moment. And, you know, whether that's true or not, I think, you know, needs to be investigated. But just the fact that this is a suicide interrupter one time, Mm -hmm. and that you can build neural pathways in your brain, actually grow gray matter in your brain. This is a huge breakthrough. And I think, um, I hope the movie uh, the Lamar movie can really shed a lot of light on ketamine and for when for what mm-hmm. it is. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, documentary films is just a great way to open people up to, you know, listen. So I think like your, your movie that you're talking about, like for your mom as a Muslim woman, who's never done mm-hmm. any psychedelics. I mean, that mm-hmm. could affect a m- millions and millions of Muslim women and people just who say, Oh, I identify with this person. And through her experience, I feel more comfortable to try this myself. Um, Because a lot of the stigma that's on these plants and things, it's really just people don't know about them. It's not that, you know, they're being suppressed or something like that. It's just a lack of education. And now we have, you know, modern communication and travel and 
we know basic science and medicine. So this is the time that we can, you know, evaluate these things for what they really are. So it's, it's really exciting. I mean, goosebumps too. I mean, I can just imagine like <laughs> what your mom could do for millions and millions of, of women. Is yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It's incredible. Cause I, because um, especially in the in Muslim culture, you know, there's a very big stigma attached to any form of mind altering substance. You know, they put alcohol and marijuana and psychedelics all in the same kind of um, bracket, if you like. You know, so to try to mm -hmm. educate people on uh, to separate their mind from psychedelics and drugs that are bad for you, um, it, was, it, was a, it was a real. A struggle for me to do that with my own mother you know it took me maybe a year just to convince her that what i was doing was actually a medicine it wasn't uh, a drug as you know as, so to say so and uh, through my change behavior through my improvements she then was convinced but it took a, i took a lot a lot of time and hard work and she's a, a more open-minded let's say a person you know some people from the east might be less open-minded so i'm really hopeful that this documentary that we're going to be filming at with me in july will have a big impact like i'm sure you're documentary will have a massive impact on people who follow the Kardashians and follow basketball and follow just because having a celebrity of that kind of status showing his transformation is going to reach millions as well you know and I'm really looking yeah. forward to being able to, sh to share that with my with my uh, community at Educate Inspire Change as well so uh, w when will it be released by by the way? Um, so we're, we're in the process of talking to the networks now I'm hoping it's streaming mm -hmm. in the next you know 30 60 mm -hmm. days something like that I mean oh. this is Really, this pandemic, I've ne you know, I couldn't have imagined a time where the movie was needed so much, you know, where now I'm seeing, wow, this pandemic, you know, when we come out of it, people are going to be yeah. traumatized. They're going to have PTSD like they've never had before. And if we can mm. triage them with the ketamine, you know, this is a really amazing opportunity. And um, what's really remarkable, I'm uh, with my business partner, Warren Gumpel, we started a company, there's not even a website yet for it, but it's called Keda MD. And what we're able to do because of the pandemic is to give people a ketamine lozenger that they put under their tongue and it melts in their mouth. And in doing that, we they can have the ketamine experience in their own home without having to go to a doctor's office. And then through telemedicine, we guide them through telemedicine. So oh. this is an incredible moment where, you know, it's, a, it's everybody can ex access this and yeah. be in present moment awareness. And at the same time, you know, when you think about the trauma that people are coming out of this with, to be able mm. to, you know, put some context on that is, it's mm. going to be incredible. So, yeah. um, but, and well, I would say, absolutely. you know, like you were saying, it's really important to be in the right set and setting to be guided. And I, you know, that's what mm. I love about Rhythmia down in Costa Rica is that they've really set up like the ultimate set and setting for you to have an mm. ayahuasca experience. So I know mm. your mom, it's like anybody I send there, you know, I don't care who they are, or what experience they have, they're going to have a good experience because the whole place and everybody's consciousness is focused on helping you to get the most out of the experience and you know that's the way to do it i think you know nowadays there's you know unfortunately there's people like ordering ayahuasca over the internet and doing it in mm. their apartment or you know buying it and trying it themselves yeah. whatever way and that's just you know you could really say you know cause some trauma to yourself if you mm. do it in the wrong way you want to be guided you want to you know get the most yeah. out of it so i think uh, it's such a blessing to have uh, Rhythmia and places that, yeah. you know, are professionally set up to guide people now. Whilst in Costa Rica last year, um, I came across a guy by the name of Anthony Walsh who handed me a bottle of hemp extract CBD oil. And after just taking a few drops, I was sold. I immediately felt more relaxed, less stressed. I found the quality of my sleep improved and it even helped me with my meditation practices. The reason this product stands out for me was Anthony himself is passionate about healing the world one person at a time and has personally invested thousands of hours researching CBD and cannabinoids in order to fully understand how to help guide others to receive the maximum benefits of taking hemp oil extracts. His company is called Eco Life Supplements and I highly recommend it to anyone that wants to have a better, happier and healthier life. It's 100% natural. Organically grown, all natural and non-GMO guaranteed for your best experience. To order yours now, please visit 
ecolifesupplements.com and quote coupon code INSPIRECHANGE for a 10% discount and they are currently only delivering in the US. I'm curious, obviously, yeah, uh, Rhythmia, I think, is the first medically licensed plant medicine retreat. Do you do you foresee in the next, like, five years, do you foresee more places like Rhythmia popping up around the world? And where do you see plants like Iboga and Ayahuasca and San Pedro and even Ketamine? Like, where do you see them in five years from now? Um, yeah, I think, I think Ketamine is going to be uh, an important part of everybody's life, you know, almost like fluoride mm-hmm. in the water. They're going to say, okay, you know what? We're living in a, tr- you know, a heavily trauma uh, life right now, almost like this is like the era of PTSD. And I think uh, ketamine is going to be acknowledged and people are going to use it uh, to avoid getting depression and anxiety, where now it's like if you have treatment resistant depression, then they're going to tell you to do it. If you've tried everything else and it doesn't work, they're going to tell you. But I think it's going to be Mm. sort of a proactive model in the next few years where people are going to say, hey, you know what? You need to be microdosing this or you need to be going for regular sessions so you don't get anxiety and you don't get depression, that you appreciate Mm. how amazing you are. And, you know, I'll tell you one anecdotal thing about ketamine is a lot of people describe, you know, feeling the sensation that they're a speck of dust and they're also the entire universe. And so when Mm. you see that and you really have the direct experience of that and you come out, you're just like, you know what? This whole thing's a miracle. I am just going to appreciate it and I'm not going to pretend that I'm here to save the world. And at the same time, I'm not going to pretend that I'm not an important part of the overall energy that's out there. And you just live your life differently. So I think ketamine, that's what's going to be the case. And then, you know, ayahuasca and ibogaine. um, You know, I put a full page ad in the New York Times. right after Donald Trump uh, got elected, he was being inaugurated. And that weekend, I knew he was still reading the New York Times and the New York Post and the Washington Post. And so I put a full page ad in the New York Times, show, you know, talking about, you know, asking him to make the opiate epidemic a first 100 day issue because it's so serious. Mm-hmm. But I, I laid out the foundation of ketamine and the foundation of ibogaine and said we have the opportunity to use these catalysts to you know work on our biggest problems that we have as a society and so i think mm-hmm. hopefully you know he maybe he could you know with the stroke of a pen i know the president is allowed to change the uh the scheduling of a drug uh, Richard mm-hmm. Nixon when he scheduled all these medications schedule 1 put a stipulation that the president in the United States can change the schedule of a drug with a the signature. And so I'm hoping that somebody like him can uh, see the opportunity to bring down the suicide rates, help the veterans, you know, mm-hmm. stop the, you know, the opiate epidemic using these catalysts. And, you know, if hopefully he can do it. If not, you know, I know Joe Biden's son, has uh, done mm-hmm. ibogaine. He is reported really? to have done ibogaine to break his addiction. So we got, um, you know, we're in a place where I think this is going to happen in the next year or so because there's no other solution. If you have a meth situation and you have a heroin and a fentanyl problem, you can't talk therapy your way out of that. But if you just sit down and do ibogaine, you're you're basically going to break that. And then if you change your lifestyle after that. You could go for years and maybe your whole life just not addicted, mm. not even craving, just in a really good place. So we're in a we're in a magic moment right now. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. You know, who knows? Maybe somebody sees your movie and mm-hmm. then some country, you know, changes the status of it, and then another one, and then you know, you just mm-hmm. don't know how these uh, dominoes are going to fall for plant medicine, but you know it's happening. Yeah, we're living in very exciting times, aren't we? Um, it's like the yeah. first time we're, we're all collectively connected through the internet. For the first time, we're having like a shared experience with this coronavirus epidemic where we're all on lockdown as a planet. We're all having the same problems, the same issues, the same you know uh, problems together, but we're all uh, 
for the first time, I feel more connected to everyone. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and it's a, yeah. it's a really a mag- magical time to be alive. Although uh, on the other side, there's a lot of pain and death, I understand. But there's also on the positive side, so much unity, so much connection. And for the first time, people are realizing what's important, which is family, your health, your mindset, yeah. your mental health, all this stuff that people are looking at for the first time, you know. And that's why I think your documentary, the sooner it can come out, the better, you know, because everyone's going to be at home just now and they're going to be eating up um, like uh, media like yours, you know, and this is important because yeah. right now there's a, there's so much fear in the media, isn't there? Everywhere you look, you're just hearing coronavirus and death and numbers, and it's really important that we try to get, um, uh, you know, like uh, educational, inspirational media under the eyes and noses of our children and our elders and all people, you know. So, like, I really hope yeah. that your documentary comes out as s- soon as possible, you know. Yes, me too. I got my fingers crossed. I I hope it's tonight. You know, it's one of those things where. <laughs> Uh, Mm. I think this is, uh, like you said, this is a moment where, you know, if you are in maybe one of these psychedelic neutral zones, you know, like Denver or Oakland, these places that have decriminalized, I mean, this could be an incredible moment for somebody who's quarantining there to go inside themselves in a way that they never have before. And I'm a huge proponent of microdosing psilocybin mushrooms. And the reason for that is I've had my own direct experience with it, but what it is is you're taking an amount that's so small that it's really sub-perceptual. So you're not having this, you know, hallucinations and tripping out. You're just, you have this energy of the plant that's powering you and you have a lot of focus, a lot of energy. And then the next day after you've microdosed, you're making really clear decisions the next day, you know, really clear. Mm -hmm. And then let's say you microdose again on the third day later as a regimen. Um, Every time I do it, I always think, wow, this is exactly what people who are taking antidepressants probably want to feel like when they take that. And here is this, you know, I don't know. 50 cents or dollars worth of this psilocybin that is causing you to, you know, just have this focus and have this appreciation, reconnect you with nature. And Mm. that's amazing. I'm encouraging anybody, if you're in a psychedelic neutral zone right now, really take the first step, do a microdose of psilocybin. It is going to be sub perceptual, but you're going to realize that this is an important part of a lifestyle of energy focus and a lot of joy because you know mm-hmm. like i think people have forgotten how to be joyful you know and just mm-hmm. accept what a miracle this is that you know the earth is yeah. a certain distance from the sun and we can live here <laughs> and we can eat and we breathe and it's so miraculous that we almost have been conditioned to be kind of like oh whatever here we are yeah. and when you do the plant medicine, it reconnects you with nature in a way that I think a lot of people are disconnected from right now. So yeah. really encourage that. Yeah, that's an interesting subject you mentioned there is our disconnection to nature, you know, because um, uh, I feel that more than ever. And that's why I've decided to make the move. I think I spoke to you before this call uh, the other day and I mentioned to you that I'm yeah. planning on moving to Costa Rica, you know, and and the main reason for that is just wanting to be closer to nature, wanting to be closer to a high vibrational kind of frequency. And I feel like Costa Rica is the kind of place where you want to raise your children where you want to be, you know. Um, so like, uh, mm-hmm. I think that's an, a, a big one is being in touch with nature and for people that are living in in cities just now i think even just spending time next to a tree in a park for half an hour you know in the morning uh that's yeah. so important you know that in itself is therapy you know it's it just being in touch with nature yeah i i totally agree i mean you know you think about city living and a lot of people they never even put their bare foot on like grass or sand mm. you know they're just always on a mm. in a shoe or they're on their in this on the cement and they're out of touch. And what one thing I love about San Pedro that you and I have both experienced is it's like one of these things where boom, you're immediately connected to nature. And yeah. I I'd say that's a big problem with people is that disconnection. And if there's something that can instantaneously connect you again, like mm. the value of that is just incredible. So yeah, a, f- a friend of mine uh, mentioned to me something that struck a chord. He said to me that. Um, 
since the invention of uh, sanitary products, w women uh, and for th for thousands of years, when they had their moon cycle or their period, they would often bleed into the land, you know. And then since the invention of sanitary sanitation uh, tampons and all this kind of stuff, it's, it's as if the planet has lost its touch with the feminine energy, and this is why masculine energy is taken over, and this is why uh, we're almost men are bleeding into the planet through war you know and uh, wow. this is some kind of so it's a really it struck a chord with me and it made me think wow you know and like because it's true when they say like we're wearing rubber soles we're lost touch with nature but also women have lost touch with nature as well from that aspect you know because they're such powerful mm -hmm. beings they're so in touch with spirituality their spirituality just by being women because they're givers of life aren't they and yeah so f for the for the planet to to lose that touch with them i think is very dangerous so uh it's just something that came into my mind when you were mentioning yeah how no in touch with nature one one thing that I just on that subject, I think, you know, ayahuasca, as I said, it's like the mother, it's described as the mother, yeah. the grandmother, you know, kind of plant. And I think a lot of men have lost their connection to the feminine energy. And when I was in my mm. ayahuasca experience, I got to reconnect to that like I'd never had before where I was like, wow, you know, I'm... I'm at least 50% feminine energy. I have the creative energy within me. And then, yeah. as I said, in the reality of truth, the one thing that really struck me is that when I came out, I realized that I had had this experience of talking to God and being in the presence of God. And it was a feminine energy. It was like the creative mm -hmm. energy of nature. And mm -hmm. I never could put that aside, you know, and so now even now when I'm out and somebody's talking religion, whatever religion it is, they always say the father, he, him, and you have mm. Buddha and Jesus and Muhammad and everybody. And, and here I was, I was with God and it was a woman. And I, and so when I think, wow, the context of religion based on this man, it's total, mm -hmm. it's wrong. And when you start out your whole premise on the wrong foot, it can cause a lot of problems down the road. And I think, you know, a lot of men, it would serve them really well to reconnect with that feminine energy yeah. that they have within them. And so Very much these so. are yeah. breakthrough, breakthrough catalysts. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think the Chinese say, may you live in exciting times. And this has got to be the most yeah. exciting time ever, this moment yeah. right here. Yeah, you you brought up a religion there, and more more and more in the last like a uh, few months, I've been seeing psychedelics and the link between psychedelics and religion. You know, and I saw this also in your documentary, uh, the reality of truth, when you were linking mushrooms and psychedelics to being the catalyst for a lot of these religions. You know, and just somewhere along the way, they've been misinterpreted, and for whatever reason, the psychedelic side of it has seems to have been omitted. You know, but um, a lot of people are talking about Moses in the burning bush and and that actually being a psychedelic experience in itself, you know? Mm -hmm. I'd love to know a little yeah. bit about your insight on that and what you think and how do you believe that psychedelics are perhaps the source of all religions? Yeah, I, I do. I think, you know, these are, you know, and they've been found now, um, you know, archaeologists have found, you know, pouches from shamans that are thousands and 10,000 years old that contain mm -hmm. DMT and cannabis and things like that. So, we know that they've been part of the religious experience. And so, you know, in my movie, The Reality of Truth, we look at, you know, the question of could uh, mana that was in the Bible uh, be mushrooms? For example, you know, in my discussions with Deepak that originally sparked the Reality of Truth movie, uh, Deepak said to me that in his Vedic tradition, there's a plant called Soma. And that Soma was considered to be like a mystery plant, like it had disappeared. And Deepak said, if you read the definition of it, it says it's a plant that doesn't come from a seed. And the only plant that doesn't come from a seed is a mushroom. It's spores that are multiplying. So he's like, in his interpretation, it's very clear that that was mushrooms. And so when you think about, you know, the fact that, you know, all of these plants uh, were potentially taken out of the religion and that, you know, meditation was potentially taken out when it says, be still and know that I am God, that that isn't, a, you know, that sounds like meditation. So mm -hmm. in the past, people, religious people always wanted to be the conduit to 
God. They wanted to sit in the middle between you and God. And these plants that connect you directly to God consciousness or the ability to sit down and meditate and be in God consciousness, it makes it no longer needed that these religious structures and leaders are there. And that's very threatening. So I think they just, you know, took those things out and said, well, you know, let's be that, uh, you know, interface between people and God. And now we're living in this time where people are realizing that, you know, everything that's been taught to us, all these institutions are not ringing true anymore. And that maybe they have to have this direct experience of going inside themselves. And that, mm -hmm. that's really exciting to me because um, it's going to disrupt in a good way religion. You know, religion's got some great things. It's, you know, uh, great, got great traditions and it brings people together and things. But when they come together, I think it would be so much more powerful on a Sunday if everybody went to a church or a temple. They took a microdose of psilocybin. <laughs> everybody sang together. You had the group effect of everybody you know, communing together with God, it would be such a beautiful experience and something that they could then take forward into the week and live that energy as opposed to now where, you know, people go to church or temple or, and they, you know, they go in and they sit there for an hour and then they come out and they go right back to their own regular life. And so if yeah, we can yeah. reconnect with God consciousness, that's going to mm -hmm. be a big turning point here. Beautiful. Uh, on that subject of connecting to God and connected to consciousness, what, what sort of daily practices have you been doing during this epidemic? I imagine you're in lockdown as well. Yes, I am. I'm locked down. Um, I am lucky. You know, I've been meditating. Somebody taught me to meditate about 25 years ago or so. And so I have been meditating a lot during this. But I'm also really lucky because, you know, and you probably have this experience yourself, but after you've done plant medicine, it's almost like you've created pathways to transcend. So now after my psychedelic experiences, my plant medicine, I can close my eyes and I can start to meditate. And then all of a sudden I'll like see a pathway, a deep pathway, mm -hmm. and I just follow it down and I transcend. And so I think psychedelics and meditation go together in a really important way. And, um, you know, without outing myself too much, I've taken the opportunity to go inside my own mind during this time, because mm. if you don't do that, um, number one, you're going to be probably out of balance. And I would say if you go your whole life and you never dive deep inside your mind, you may have actually missed the whole point of existing mm. in the physical realm. So yeah. I am lucky. Yeah. I have a prescription with for some ketamine from a doctor as well. So I'm able to awesome. take some super amazing journeys. Um, and, and that's really gotten me through this. It's like, I don't know how people are getting through this right now without meditation and catalyst to help them to go deep. I just, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm hoping that when they come out, even though I know mm -hmm. they're going to be more damaged, that they're going to be able yep. to access the ketamine and the plant medicine. Yeah, beautiful. You you mentioned something there, um, how like um, if people haven't done psychedelics at least once or twice in their life, they've sort of missed the bus. Yeah. Do you, do you feel like that this is the key to life, that this is perhaps what we're preparing ourselves for when we die, that maybe when we die, we're going to be going to those other realms and our ability to navigate them might um, be what we're trying to learn in this life. Does that mm. resonate with you at all? Yeah. That really resonates with me on two levels. Um, number one, I think the the point of life is to know yourself, you know, and that, I didn't make that up, but that's the whole point of the thing is to understand yourself and know yourself. And so if there are these natural catalysts that can help us to go inside, understand ourselves, um, that might be the point of life. And if you don't do that, that could be pretty tragic. Um, mm -hmm. number one, number two, um, you know, when you do go inside and have these experiences, uh, 
when you come out and you're living your day-to-day life and you're resonating at a frequency that is um, helping other people or allows you to have empathy. Because I think this is the real key is, you know, right now, I think we're having an empathy crisis. And by empathy crisis, I mean that, you know, people want to care and they truly do want to care, but it's really hard to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and to feel what they're feeling. And a lot of times when you have a plant medicine experience or deep psychedelic experience, what happens is you come out with more empathy. And I believe if we had enough people, a critical mass of people who were with more empathy, we could solve any problem we have as a society really, really easily. You know, we would just all start thinking about, oh, you know, what about the person who's going to live 100 years from now? Or what about us when we need water 50 years from now? Huh, this is, uh, I, I feel it. And so this empathy crisis, I think we have to, we have to solve it. And the way we're going to solve it is through these catalysts that bring you into this present moment awareness and you come out with more empathy. It's a really easy solution. That's why I'm, <laughs> despite all the, you know, trauma that's out there, I feel really good because this is a easy, easy solution. Yeah. And it, it feels like we're sort of on the front line of this movement, you know, obviously uh, psychedelics have been around for a long, long time, but we're seeing a resurgence since like Terence McKenna in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and now uh, in this millennium with all these plant medicine retreats popping up like Jerry Powell and Rhythmia, documentaries like yours and mine's. It feels like there's a movement and it's really, really picking up ahead of steam about now. And it's almost a matter yeah. of time before the medicine takes over and it, it, it's working through us. I really feel like um, when I done ayahuasca and I was asking the medicine to, to show me my purpose, to show me why I'm here, I felt like it was really giving me my own voice and giving me the courage to speak my truth, you know? And I feel like it's doing this to everyone who does the medicine. It's showing them their purpose, their path, and people are feeling called to nature. They're feeling called to live healthier lives. They're feeling called to spread the message of truth or the message of plants, if you want to call it, you know? Yeah. So I really, I really feel like um, it's almost like a call to arms and we're all, we're all leading the, we're all like kind of waging a war against separation, against negativity, you know, against um, kind of um, not capitalism, but consumerism, if you like. And um, I, I really feel like a, it's an honor and a privilege to be alive just now and to be at the front of this line alongside people like yourself, you know? Yeah, no, it's really beautiful. I mean, I think nature is very, very intelligent and it knows that mm. people are hurting right now and that they need a way to tap into spirituality and healing. And so it's bringing mm. out these plants. And I think mm -hmm. even cannabis, marijuana coming out the way it has is mm. it's a really important step because a lot of people, including, let's say, my mom, who's you know in her 70s and never done any drugs or anything like that, uh, you know, now that it's legal and she's been able to take it and have an experience where she goes, wow, you know what, this is actually helping with, you know, my whatever pain I have, and this is good for me. Uh, they're realizing on that level that, hey, you know what, some of these plants mm -hmm. that we've been told are bad, maybe they're actually medicine and they're good. So that opens mm -hmm. the door to the ayahuasca, the ibogaine to come out riding the coattails of cannabis. And like you said, um, you know, this is that moment where we get yeah. that reconnection and we also get that group consciousness thing that happens when a group meditates together or a group does ayahuasca together. There's a, there's a, a group effect and, you know, it happened in our ayahuasca, uh, down in Peru. And I was there with Michelle Rodriguez and a bunch of our friends and there was a shaman and, his assistant. And so there was 13 of us all together in this ayahuasca. And, you know, people had drank different amounts of the ayahuasca. Some people were, you know, one guy was six foot five and, you know, Michelle is like, you know, a, a, you know, a hundred something mm -hmm. pounds. So, you know, you would think with drinking different amounts and everything, everybody would have, you know, this, uh, it would last a different amount of time. And what happened that was so incredible is about seven hours after we had started this thing, um, all of a sudden in this one moment, which is the ayahuasca frequency, it like left the room. And we all like mm. opened our eyes up and we were like, we looked around and we're like, did you just come out? I just came out, you came out. 
And we realized mm. that the whole group came out in the exact same moment. Mm. And when you realize that, you're like, wow, you know, we were connected. We, we all knew that we had used ESP to communicate with each other during that session to try to help each other during difficult parts of the journey. And so mm. you think about the collective, like you're saying, where the planet right now is connected and people you know, it's just, it's such an amazing time for these plants that the uses for them are, are really incredible. And, and it just probably, again, nature's very intelligent and it's bringing these plants out. And, you know, I just want to make one example. I was watching the nature channel the other day, just to show you how intelligent plants are. And there was these uh, fruit bats that were eating the fruit from a tree in the rain for in this rainforest. And the, the bats would drop the seeds after they ate the plants. And then they would also like poop out the, the seeds and it would grow new plants. And so the plants realized that this was beneficial and they started to adapt to make it easier for the bats to hold on to the trees. So <laughs> when you think about it, you're like, wow, you know, these plants knew that the bats were doing this and they changed to make it easier for them to do that's that's intelligence and that's yeah. undeniable and you know 50 years ago or 200 years ago that would have been thought to be insane but here I am I'm watching yeah. it on you know National Geographic and when you yeah. think about that intelligence and then you think about the fact that these plants are here to heal us um, you know yeah. this is a big opportunity Really big. Nature is the best teacher, so they say. Yes. Trust <laughs> nature. These are my, my three yeah. guideposts right now are go inside, trust nature, and don't take anything seriously. <laughs> um, those, I think if you do that, you can have a, an amazing mm. life. You can have a great plant medicine journey. Um, there's a mm. quote from the Maharishi that I really love. Uh, he taught the Beatles to meditate Maharishi. And he, his quote is, we have the serious responsibility to take nothing serious. Mm. And I think if you can live that, you're, you know, you're living a very enlightened life. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I think that's a good note to end on. Um, I, I, just before we go, I, I wonder, is there anything else that you want to let anyone know about? The, I think the, your, your documentaries you out soon maybe remind people the name of it where it might be featured yep. and if there's any any other websites or things you want to share please uh, let us know now for sure yeah so the movie's called lamar odom reborn and the website mm -hmm. you can check out um is odomreborn.com uh if anybody has any interest uh in the ketamine i would urge you to check out the ketamine fund ketaminefund.org and you can see a lot of the veterans that we've given the ketamine to and the transformations that they've had some, you know, one guy was on 22 medications. He's now on none, just doing his ketamine boosters, you know, people that were suicidal that are now just, you know, hugging their kids and feeling the love. So, you know, ketaminefund.org and a powerful place to get information on that. And, um, yeah, if anybody wants to check out The Reality of Truth, check out therealityoftruth.com. It's free on YouTube mm. and Amazon Prime. And um, mm. yeah, I'm just really excited. If every person who, you know, hopefully sees that, maybe their fear level about doing this comes down a yeah. little bit. And maybe, you know, I crack them a little bit with that. And then they see your movie mm. or your podcast. And then they see, you know, Jerry Powell doing his thing. And it's like, then they go, ah, yeah. oh, you know what? I think I can do this. I feel it. Yeah. And so that's what this is about to me. It's just educating people and trying to bring down the fear level on this so that they can go inside and, you know, mm. know themselves. Well, you're doing a great job at educating and inspiring people because you certainly educated and inspired me with your documentary, you know, uh, and it's been a total honor to have you on today. I really hope that we get to stay in touch after this, you know, uh, I'm excited to see your journey yeah. where it takes you as well. Uh, and I'm sure I'd love we'll to come bring... down this summer and maybe see oh, you at please. Rizinia, you know, I'll be, I'll be there. You've got an open invite. Yeah, you're, you're more than welcome. I'd love to have you there as my guest. And I know Jerry would love to have you there as well. Awesome. So, I'll see you, I'll see you soon.
All right. Okay, man. Thank Enjoy. you. Take care. Thanks, Peace, man. Peace. 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 Bye. For the last year and a half, I've been working on a documentary called Pantera. It's a documentary series, and each series will follow me around a different plant medicine retreat. The first episode, Pantera, Our Plant Medicine Journey Begins, is due to be released in the coming weeks. If you would like to keep up to date with what we're doing and receive the latest updates and releases, sign your name at pantera.film. Thank you so much for listening to the Educate Inspire Change with Cash Can podcast. Your support means a lot to me. And if you would like to continue supporting me, please follow and subscribe. We're on SoundCloud, Spotify, Facebook, YouTube and iTunes. And please leave a positive review wherever you can. Thank you.